uh, welcome. Those of you that have come this far uh, to take this class, you've, you've, you've gone through almost all of the courses that we have developed for fabrication shop welding. And so it's time to address the type of equipment that you're going to run into. Uh, during your time here in the welding lab, you've been exposed to a lot of hand tools and some power tools and so forth. But in welding shops, they have a lot of material handling equipment that you need to be familiar with. And it will take you long to become acclimated to it, but there's a lot of things in a, in a fabrication shop that, that you're going to be needing to be familiar with and trained on and uh, knowing about the safety aspects of them. So if you'll turn to page 941 in your textbook, this is chapter 26, General Equipment for Welding Shops. I'm going to go over this stuff fairly briefly because there's not a whole lot I can tell you about it other than uh, introduce you to it and, and how it's used. Um, and when you get to your test, there'll be 25 questions related to this chapter. And I'll give you a heads up on where everything's at. So to begin with, on page 941, highlight screens and booths because most welding labs will, will use some kind of a, of a screening system. Um, as you know, in taking welding safety, uh, the, the arc puts out ultraviolet and infrared rays that are harmful to everybody. And it can be even reflected off of walls, surfaces like this. And the American Welding Society puts out a standard for uh, paint reflection and, and how bad different types of paint will reflect stuff. Uh, so having adequate screening and booths are very important. So I'm going to read from your book here and it says, whenever welding is done in a shop where others are doing other jobs, these workers must be protected from the effects of arc rays, the spatter of the molten metal, and sparks. Uh, in areas given over to the welding of small parts, permanent booths are erected. They are made of sheet metal or heavy canvas and they are painted with a special protective paint. The booths are often equipped with exhaust fans uh, for removing fumes and ducts uh, for introducing and for introducing uh, fresh air. Very similar to the system we have in our welding lab. Portable screen is used to shield large work, work when the uh, welding equipment must be taken to the job. Uh, if you look at our welding lab, you, you know we have uh, three or four portable screens and they're very similar to these. And what we can do with those is we can surround work that we don't, al don't already have a booth for. And you can see these are kind of an orange colored uh, screen. Very similar to the, to the, to the uh, plastic uh, screening material that we have over each of our welding booths. But you can see this one, it's portable. They can just be dragged all over the shop. So if you're out in a shop area and away from your normal welding fabrication spot, you would use some of these screens to protect, it, uh, protect that area and protect others. Actually, MSHAW can, can issue a fine if any welding arc flash comes out of those areas. So it's very important for those of you that are working in the mines. Um, all the mines have fabrication shops where they do maintenance repair. And if an MSHAW guy comes through there and, and, and some of your flash is visible, um, even if it's 100 feet away, they can write the company up as a nonconformant. So you want to make sure that your area is shielded uh, as well as it can. So uh, it says portable screens are used to shield uh, equipment. Uh, a semi-transparent curtain constitutes a near-ideal welding curtain, exhibiting good visibility, minimizing the arc glare, and reflecting unstable light, uh, pardon me, usable light back to the work area. There are a variety of colors, spectra orange, yellow, green, gray, and blue. Uh, one of the best semi-transparent curtains colors is spectra orange. No other transparent welding curtain material manipulates light waves like the spectra orange curtain. With its special patented poly polyvinyl chloride formula, Spectra Orange absorbs, scatters, and filters the light spectrum to create safety, uh, safer working environments for the welder and the surrounding and his surrounding co-workers. Dropping down to the bottom of that paragraph on page 942, it says the green color uh, can be had in extra dark to stop all ultraviolet rays and in blue and blue light. This dark color is recommended for plasma arc cutting and other bright welding applications. So that's a little bit about there. You will have a question on that, so make sure you read that. Then we're talking about fume expo exposure. Uh, in that same paragraph, it says, uh, special ventilation systems are required to remove smoke, 
fumes and particulate matter from the breathing zone. Welding fumes should not be randomly discharged into the atmosphere and need to be filtered. The cost of cooling or heating a fabrication area dictates the need to recirculate filtered clean air and not discharge it outdoors. This is a, a, this is a slide that I wanted to throw in here to show you that the position of the head, and we've gone over this before in other classes, is the single most important factor in avoiding fume exposure. And so he's keeping his head back away from it. And flux core arc welding produces a huge amount of smoke and particulate matter. So you want to be very careful not to get your head in the fume plume. And of course, the way you can tell if you're too close uh, will be indicated by how quickly your clear lens darkens up, how quickly it absorbs the smoke and gets obscured by smoke. Uh, so you want to keep your head out of the fume plume and then position your vents so that it's sucking the air away like so. And that's a good way to, to do that. And then of course you have fume and gas removal systems like these. This is a big precipitator similar to what we have of course. Ours have screens over or vents over all of the work areas but some places don't. And you may run into something like this. Uh, you have to vent that, that stuff in some manner. Uh, I want to draw your attention to figure 26.2 at the bottom of the page. We have a, a fil filtering system very similar to that. We have one of these things. And uh, what that does, it's a machine that, that it's portable. You take it right where you're working and you can set it up and it'll suck the air out in case you don't have a system that will go overall. Um, let's see. Next I want to talk about work holding devices. There's um, two bullets right here. Once parts for weldment are actual, accurately produced, they must be held in position for welding. This is done with the devices called fixtures, jigs, or tooling, each of which has essentially the same meaning. Their function is to hold parts in proper alignment during the assembly of a weldment. Fixtures promote good fit-up tolerances, resulting in consistently high quality uh, weldments. Then over on the next page it says the following advantages of, of fixtures should be considered and they are uh, improve fit up of parts to achieve tighter tolerances, locate and orient parts for easier loading of parts by the operator, help identify parts that are out of tolerance, help control weld distortion, reduce labor costs to produce a weldment, provide more consistent quality, reduce production errors by having fixtures accurately identified. So you could use a series of fixtures to do this and I don't have my marker. Excuse me one moment. Okay, so jigs and fixtures could be, could be anything as simple as having a tabletop and you might put a little tab there and a little tab there and another tab there and you're going to lay a piece of steel on it like so and it's going to be lined up around those tabs so that you have an accurate corner every time. That's just a real simple example of a fixture. Uh, and it will hold your parts in place while you're, while you're making that, that fit up in that weld. So read about welds, uh, weld fixtures. There's three bullets coming out of the items that I've already just spoken about. Then modular tooling says by using modular tooling in the form of platens, locators, bracing, and various clamping devices, much greater flexibility is permitted, when, um, permitted than when custom-built fixtures intended for a single weldment are used. The platene has a precision hole pattern which allows the location of various devices. This type of, of product is accurate, rigid, and easy to set up and use. The table that we have out there in the welding lab uh, right next to our uh, coordinate shape cutter is a, is a platine. And all that is, it's a table with square holes in it. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen it, it's got square holes all the way around it. Uh, and what you do is you can drop a pin in these, in these holes wherever you want, whatever location you want to do something similar to this and then you just put your parts in it and, and when you're done you can tap them out of there with a hammer and move them and rearrange them. Uh, very neat thing to, to use and we've actually used that platine out in the welding lab to uh, assemble uh, race car bodies. Uh, we had a class one time where we, where we did some frames um, for, for uh, dirt track race cars and we used, uh, let's see, it was chrome molly tubing and we TIG welded it with chrome molly tubing and, and that's, the, that's the kind of fit up and tolerances we could achieve. We put, put an entire body up there. Uh, welding positioners. So what are welding positioners? That, uh, welding positioners 
permit the placing of weldments in, a, in the flat position for optimal welding. They have plain table areas that can be tilted and rotated in any direction. On the smaller positioners, the table is moved by hand wheels or gears, and on the large positioners, by electric gear drives. And there's a picture of one, actually these four pictures down in the left-hand corner of your book, and it shows a, a welding positioner. It's basically a, a table that you can tilt, and you put your stuff on it like here, and you can, e you can either have it straight up and down, or you can tilt it to a 45, or you can tilt it to a 90 degree. Uh, you can even rotate it down if you want to. Um, and you, by the use of, of just cranking it or using a button with, with an electric power drive, you can change the position of welding. So if you, if you wanted to weld it like this, uh, you could come down and weld a flange on something down here. So it would be, you could be welding in the flat. Uh, here, if, if you had pipe, and this is very common, uh, you've got, you got a joint fit up a pipe right there, you put it on this, on this positioner and rotate it, and then you can still weld flat right on top here. So there's a lot of different things you can do with it. Very common, very, very common. You're going you're gonna to see that all the time. So know about platines and know about positioners. And um, in, in, the in the column there, the second column where it says they have plain table areas that can be tilted and rotated in any direction. On the smaller positioners, the table is moved by hand, hand wheels or gears. And on the larger ones, by electric gear drives. Put a bullet there, and then there, I have two bullets in the next paragraph. So you'll be getting a question out of there, so know what positioners are. Uh, I, I emphasize that so much because they are so common. In the next column, it goes on uh, all the way up to turning rolls. There are three more bullets in that next column. So read and study about positioners. Uh, we have one in the welding lab, but if you, if you remember it or you want to go in and look at it, you know, uh, or get with me, and I'll show you how it works. And they're, they're, they're great. They have, uh, they have three jaws typically that you can you can tighten up just like on a lathe and it will it will clamp onto your your part and you can either go inside a piece of pipe or you can go on the outside of a piece of pipe those are all things that you need to know turning rolls a couple of bullets here um, it says welding fabricators who do do a great deal of tank fabrication depend on turning rolls to make circumferential welds in the flat position without interruption in the travel those of you that have already taken uh, submerged arc welding know what we're talking about here because we have a set of rolls uh, that we use for the sub arc and on this end we have we have our rolls and they are electric powered you put your pipe in here and it goes on over and then you have a set another set of rolls right here and the second set is, is not powered and this is, these, these are called your idlers these, these are just idler rolls and all they do is support the other end. And then you, you come down with your, with your flux core and you make your weld wherever you need to make it, and you just roll it. Now, we do it in the welding lab. We do it on pipe, and that's about all we do. But if you get into a fabrication shop, you can do stuff that is humongous. Uh, I've seen stuff uh, as wide as 12 feet in diameter turned on turning rolls. And this material might be three inches thick. And they'll, they'll just set them all up, make sure everything's aligned. You've got you to make sure one of the biggest problems you have with these rolls is, is your piece will walk on you. If, if it's not properly uh, lined up, um, it, will, it will have a tendency to travel just like a corkscrew, and it will slowly corkscrew its way off of these rolls. So you have to, before you ever start welding, you have to make sure that everything's properly lined up, and you can roll it over and over and over and over again without it moving at all. So yeah, you want to be very careful about, about getting it properly aligned so it doesn't corkscrew or, or walk off of there for you. So read about there, the, about turning rolls, because um, there, there's a couple of bullets that come out of there. Also read about the, uh, the sling type turning rolls on the next page. And then if you look at the picture where it says figure 26-7, well, this, the reason I wanted to point this out to you is because they, they have a uh, a, a piece of equipment on a boom there, and that's, a, that's something else that you may run into. This is a picture of, of gas metal arc welding being done in a fabrication shop, and, and here's, their, here's their power supply, and here are boom controls, and then all the way out here on the end of this boom is your actual welding machine, and the guns for this gas metal arc simply drop down and they're welding right here, so they can take this power supply and, and position it right over what they're welding. 
So you may come into a situation where you're using a boom to get closer to your work. Uh, and then you can, you can make all your, your, your adjustments right here. You can adjust the boom right there. Uh, your power supply is right there. It's very convenient. Uh, another thing they'll do is they'll use cranes, just little, little small overhead cranes, and they'll pull it back and forth on, on the crane. And, and it, it does, it's not as versatile as this because it'll only swing out and, out and back, but then you have a button where you can raise it up or lower it down. They get around too, but they're not as versatile as these. So be aware that you may come into a situation where you're using a boom in order to get close to your work. Okay, let's see. Weld grippers, uh, turn the page, this is a bullet. And if you look at figure 26.9, uh, you see that we have a triangular looking fixture like this with, with a jaw on each end. And that's what I was talking about earlier. You would put your pipe or your flange or whatever in those jaws and then, then you can tighten these things and it'll, it'll hold it in place and then you simply rotate it. And all of them I've ever worked with have three. Uh, I've never seen them with more, I've never seen them with less. They all have three. And uh, that will be a question on your test, so be aware of that. Highlight that and understand it. There's a really good picture right next to it, 2610, and you can see they've got a sub arc there where they're, uh, where they're practicing sub submerged arc welding on a pinwheel. Okay, a turntable. Turntable is similar to a pinwheel, but it'll only go around in circles. Uh, weld seamers, highlight that and read about weld seamers. And I wanted to show you a picture of one. This is figure 2614 in your textbook. And it didn't blow, it, did, it didn't transfer very well. But I had the opportunity to see one of these things in California at uh, Lockheed Martin where they build um, fuel tanks for the Atlas Centaur rockets. And you can see down below here they have a very thin piece of steel and they can cut that stuff or pardon me weld that stuff as thin as five thousandths of an inch and what they'll do is they'll put it in there and this head will move back and forth along along uh, the joint and they can get just super precise accuracy and super precise welds and now the one I saw had a circular had a circular wheel and this wheel rotated and as it rotated, uh, there was contact right here at the bottom, and it used resistance welding. It was resistance seam welding. So you may see uh, a, a setup similar to this, but it may have a wheel, and as it's rolling along at this point of contact, it's creating a weld through resistance, resistance seam welding. Um, I mentioned that because we're going to talk about spot welders here in a little bit. So know that. Uh, side beam carriage, that's a bullet. Know what a side beam carriage is. Let's see, they have a picture of one on page 950, the very next page. A side beam carriage. You can see what they've got here. It's similar to what we have set up in the welding lab for our submerged arc welding. Well, typically we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll, we'll roll a pressure vessel or some pipe to make a circumferential weld. But they'll also roll sheet metal or sheet steel, and it could be a quarter inch thick, um, up to three inches thick, like I showed you here on the board. And when they, after they roll it, then they have to make that weld right down the center of it, and then they'll use a side beam carriage for that. And so they can make a li nice, long, straight run with their sub arc and weld it all up. So remember that, that will be on your test as well. Um, while we're on this page, look at picture 2618. Uh, what this is, it's, a, it's an expanding uh, motorized lift, and it can go up or down, of course, and you can, you can walk it. Typically, they'll have controls so that you can walk it forward or backward. It'll scissor up or scissor down. It's just one, one way of getting a welder next to the work. If you have to get up high, you can, you can use those. In construction sites, more so than in fabrication shops, they'll use a, a man lift which actually has a boom like on a cherry picker and, and you'll stand in a basket out here and you can pick it up and I've been 40 feet in the air in, in some of those things. They're a little inconvenient in fabrication shops because you're usually pressed for space and so the, you're more likely to run into to one of these motorized scissor, scissor lifts uh, in a fabrication shop. 
um, magnetic grip fixtures. Well, they've got a picture of, they've got a, several pictures here on the next page about magnetic grips. And what they are, it, it, would, it could be something similar to this. And you can see this is cut in several different ways. And you can lay it down flat if you needed to do 45s. Or you can come up like this if you needed to do 90s. And these are simply fixed magnets. And these fixed magnets can be used to hold your parts in place if you're working by yourself, especially. And then you can, you can tack them all up. Or uh, if you look at the picture 26, 21, they're showing an angle finder like this. And the angle finder is magnetized. So if you have to get a particular angle, you can use this to line it up and it'll keep it in place, hold it in place while you're making your tacks. So this would be an angle finder. So be aware of these because there's going to be some questions about how uh, you would hold, place, hold things in place. And you would do it through permanent fixed magnets. So magnetic attraction is what's going to hold those in place for you. Typically, it was all, it's always been my experience that when I'm in a fabrication shop, uh, you'll, have, you'll have a helper. Usually, you'll have a helper. Now, I built, I built an awful lot of pressure vessels in my time, and sometimes you didn't have a helper. Uh, and in a, in a case like that, what we would have to do is use what we call jacks. And you can buy these things, but, but more probably, you're going to make them yourself. And all they are is a tube. And these tubes typically are like one inch in diameter. and you. You put a bolt in here, pardon me, put, put a nut in here, and then you can screw a bolt into it. And so that way, by, by putting a bolt into it, you can, you can raise or lower this uh, to get whatever height you need. Say you had to put a, put a flange down into a pressure vessel. Well, and that's got to be 12 inches high from, from the surface of the pressure vessel to the top of the flange with a plus, plus or minus tolerance of one inch of an inch. So you would put some of these jacks on both sides, or even on three sides more typically. And once you got it in there and got it all lined up, then you could go ahead and make your tacks and then remove these things. And that way you can work by yourself. But whenever you're fitting something like this, remember you're not only leveling it across this way, but you're also leveling it back and forth this way. But then in addition to that, flanges usually have, well, all flanges will have, a bolt pattern. So not only do you have to have to level it both ways like so, but you have to make sure that the bolt pattern is lined up with the, with the edge of the pressure vessel so that the bolt pattern is to hold to the pressure vessel. And when you do that, usually the way to do that is to just take, take a level and lay it across there, the top of the bolts, and you can put your eyeball along the edge of the level and line it up with the side of the pressure vessel. And that way you can, you can make sure everything's in line. So you get everything as close as you can, then you tack it up, and then you're your own best inspector, so you make it as accurate as you can before you call for uh, the fit-up inspector to come and look. And uh, uh, it's always good to have a second pair of eyes look at it. Even if you know it's right, it's always good because sometimes you'll miss some things. And, and I did an awful lot of fit-up inspection. I, I built these things often enough, uh, and, and, and as a result, I would have to check out the layout before that hole was ever cut for, for, the, for my coworkers. And then they would fit it up, and then I would go and check it to make sure that the fit-up was correct. So these, this is just some examples. And if you, another way of two-holding this would be to take this pressure vessel and roll it on the side, like so, so that this thing is sticking straight out. And you can see the, the bolt pattern like this. And then you can put what are called two-hole pins. These are two-hole pins. You would put two-hole pins into those holes, like so. And then you would lay a level across, across the top like that. And these things are spring-loaded. You simply have to push this in, and they'll come apart. And then you put that through the bolt hole, and the other side through the bolt hole, and you just clamp them in like so. And make sure they're nice and tight, and then you just put, lay your level across there, and you can actually level it to make sure it's, it's correct. So there's, there's a number of ways of doing it, but you have to have special tools. OK. So, so magnetic grip fixtures are, are uh, Take, take that away from this page. Take the side beam carriage away from this page. Take the scissor elevators away from this page. Uh, and then we have track and trackless carriage systems. If you look on the next page, again, I apologize. These, these aren't very good pictures. This is figure 2622. And you see a guy here setting up a, a wire feeder. And he's using a flux core arc welding gas. 
Same thing you, you guys are doing. Now where you are, you're all doing uh, pipe, this guy's doing plate. And what you can do is you can take these, these tracks and they're very similar to the tracks that we use for our, for our cutter, for our, uh, for our track burner, our, our oxyacetylene track burner. But in this case, it's just a single piece and these are magnetized. And you can, you can set, set them down and it'll just stick on whatever you're welding. You can see he's, he's on an incline here, he's on a slope. And he'll, he adjusts this machine and all it is is a mechanized feeder. And it'll, it will just walk across here once he has everything set up. And I've seen these things in operation. They can do overlay or they can make seam welds. And if he's using flux core, that's fine. So, uh, the ones I've seen done and the ones I've used have been with MIG, gas metal arc. And you set this up and they have what they call a wiggler. And the wiggler sits there and it, and it moves the gun back and forth like this. And sometimes you can adjust how wide it goes and how narrow it goes. So he, all he has to do is set everything up, punch a button, and just stand back and monitor it. And, and you can do a lot of welding with this. Now, now, pay attention to this because there's going to be a question on your test regarding this. Now, they can take this thing, and it's so versatile that they can even flip it over and weld upside down with it. Or they could hook, hook up an oxycetylene cutting torch to it, and they could cut upside down with it. Because what would happen then, these things would... Uh, uh, they would be geared and, and this drive mechanism would be geared and locked in to this track so that it couldn't fall off. And you could still use magnets or if you had to you could actually tack weld it on there with some adapters so you didn't mess up the, uh, the uh, 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 track itself. But yeah, you can, you can flip, and I've done it. I've flipped them upside down and, and I've cut stuff upside down with this. So it's very versatile. So keep all of that in mind. Uh, let's see. So you can weld in all positions with it and you can cut in all positions with it and uh, that's about it there orbital welding orbital welding I've got four bullets on on what you what you see there on pardon me on page uh, 952 and it says this type of welding machine is used to make groove welds on pipe and tube butt joints certain welding heads are designed to make tube to sheet welds for boilers and heat exchangers Orbital welding is typically done with the gas tungsten arc or gas metal arc process. When the gas tungsten arc process is used and joint thickness and design are appropriate, the welds can be made autogenously. That is, they can be made without any filler metal. There are two basic types of orbital heads, those with open arc and those with enclosed heads. Uh, because of their design, the enclosed heads are typically used for smaller diameter pipe and tube with thin wall thickness that can be autogenously welded. Orbital systems are used when the pipe is held stationary and the welding head moved around the pipe. Um, and you can see figure 2625 is one where, they, where, where they can go around the pipe with it and it's got a, this is actually a TIG process and they're feeding the wire off, continuously off of the, um, off that little spool you see there in figure 2625. Uh, these things were really big for a time. Uh, we don't teach it because they are somewhat specialized. Uh, but you should know about it. You should at least know what orbital welding is. Orbital systems are used when the pipe is held stationary and the welding head moves around the, around the pipe in the 2G, 5G, and 6G positions. It takes sophisticated computer controls to deal with the various welding procedures required for the welding positions that will be encountered. These units are highly portable and when combined with the appropriate inverter welding power source, the controls uh, produce very high quality and consistent welds. Very popular. That, that tube to sheet uh, in heat exchangers, uh, if, in case you're not familiar with heat, heat exchangers, what they do is you've got a tube here, I mean, you've, you've got a sheet here and a whole bunch of little tiny holes in it. And these holes can be different diameters. And what they do is they go down like so and come back again. And they're enclosed in, in a big old pressure vessel. And all of these little holes have to be welded. And what they'll use, they'll, if you look at figure 26, 27, you see that little gun there, they'll put that little ram down inside there and then they'll weld around those things using, using orbital welding in that technique. So it's a tube to sheet seal welding application for boilers and heat exchangers. Um, very common. Okay, so know about orbital welding. Then staying on page 954, Miscellaneous equipment, that's a bullet, highlight that. In addition to position equipment previously described, cranes, chains, hoists, jacks, clamps, and tongs 
are required for handling and positioning of the work. A generous supply of C-clamps of all types and sizes, hold down clamps, wedges, bars, and blocks are necessary for the proper spacing and lining up of parts. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows what a, what a C-clamp is. Here's, here's one. Um, I just brought this in to, to show you. And a, a lot of times we'll, we'll actually cut off this bottom and then you can use it and you'll, you'll, you'll weld it onto a pressure vessel or something and you can press this down and you can raise and lower say the, uh, say the pressure vessel you can raise or lower the pressure vessel skin to the head to, to, to make your fit, to make your alignment. Or you could simply use it to clamp two pieces together. Um, another thing, if you look at figure 2628, this is a hold down clamp. And these things are tacked on and adjusted. And then you take that, take that handle there and press down and it, it'll force it into place and, and, and hold it in place that way. So you're going to use a lot of clamps. You're going to use a lot of wedges, various size wedges. Uh, to make your fits. Accuracy is, is the important thing when you work in a fabrication shop. Most fab work is to plus or minus an eighth of an inch, but always inspect your blueprints to see what tolerances are allowable. So that's a bullet under miscellaneous equipment. Um, preheating and annealing equipment. If you look on the next page, figure 2631, shows a uh, high frequency induction heating system and what that is let me throw it up here on the screen what they do with that is you can see here they, they've wrapped some coils around a piece of pipe and sometimes you'll see them like this sometimes you'll see them with ceramic tiles instead and they can do a lot of things with this and you need to remember they can they can preheat something you might, you might have to make a weld out here, say another piece will come up to it. You'll make a weld out here, in which case they would be preheating this, this piece to be welded. Or they could, you could already have completed the weld, and they've wrapped that completely around the weld and around the heat affected zone area, and now they're stress relieving it. So they're, they're doing a couple of things there. So they're, they're, they, you can preheat it, you can stress relieve it, or you can post weld heat treat it. Um, you can leave it on there and let it bake for a while. You know, in stress relieving, all you're going to do is relieve the stresses in there. Post weld heat treating, you're going to allow it to bake for a time so that any hydrogen that might be in the weldment can precipitate out. So there's really three things, and you need to remember it. You're going to use uh, something like this to preheat it, to stress relieve it, or to post weld heat treat a part. So you may see this. This is, this is typically beyond beyond the uh, uh, venue of a, of, of a welder. You, want, you will probably won't have to do this yourself, but if you're seeing it done, you should be versed in it uh, well enough to know and recognize what's happening, what the operation is. So uh, read about that. You will have a question on it, and that's on page 955, and it runs over to uh, part of 956. Okay, sandblasting equipment. Well, we have a sandblaster on campus. I don't know if you're aware of that. But it's down in the auto lab. It's either in the auto lab or the diesel lab now. I don't remember what, which one. And it looks very much like this one. That's in your book. And uh, what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a chamber with a, with a glass window here and two places for your hands. You stick your hands in there and you have a gun. And if, 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 you, if you look at this figure, you have two hoses coming in. One is your, your air and the other one is, is the grit. It's whatever it is you're using to do the sandblasting with. Now the one here on campus uses uh, uh, glass beads, but they can use different things and this is what your question is going to be about. Uh, read about the sandblasting equipment and the question you're going to get is uh, something to re related to uh, what type of material will they use in a sandblaster? Will they use sand? Will they use glass? Will they use whatever? and you're going to have to be able to answer that question. Very typical. And there's another question related to this. Uh, a sandblaster can be used to clean apart, cleans apart really well. Uh, so you can clean it before you weld it, and then when you're done welding, you can also clean, use it to, to clean off any rust or any, any slag, any mill scale, anything. So you can use the sandblaster to clean apart before welding and then to clean it again uh, after welding. So, there's going to be a couple of questions in, on your test related to those two items. What kind of grit do they use? Um, that is, what kind of abrasive material do they use in sandblasting? And what do they use the sandblasting for? What gives you the cleanest weld uh, when you're done welding? 
uh, well, sandblasting will. I mean, you could you can use an, uh, a wire will and brush it off, but sandblasting takes it down to the bare metal. Okay. Next, spot welding. Well, a little bit earlier, I talked about a resistance spot weld, a resistant seam welder that used the, the wheel, and you could do long seams. If you take a look at figure 2633, and again, it's, it's, it's on this same page, right here, this fellow is using a resistant spot welder. And if you look carefully, he's got two tongs coming out, electrodes, and he's taken a piece of steel and he's lapped it. So this is, this is a lap joint. He's, he's, laid, he's, he's laid one on top of the other. He's putting it between those tongs, stepping on the foot feed, brings those tongs together, and for a prescribed length of time, they'll pass elec electricity through that. And that will create a weld. It's going to basically melt those two pieces of metal together, and the strength of the weld is determined by, by the size of the spot. So uh, how, however much electricity he's passing through that and how long he holds it is going to determine that, the size of that spot. We do have one of these on campus. I believe it's in uh, Glenn Dalton's classroom, his, his lab. So if you haven't seen one yet, go over and take a look at that. It's pretty neat. And again, it's a very common piece of equipment, very fast, very fast. It's just, you put it in, go boom, boom, you're done. Boom, boom, you're done. It's just that fast. So you're going to have a question about spot welders. So read about spot welding. In fact, uh, yeah, you're going to have one or two questions on spot welding. So read that very thoroughly. Next, hydraulic tools at the bottom of, the, of that column. This is a bullet. Highlight this. To a great extent, hydraulic tools have replaced hand tools in today's welding shop. The demands of production, fabrication, testing, maintenance, and setup operations are such that special tools must be used. Hydraulic tools uh, can do anything that hand tools can do, but faster, with tons of a controlled force. High-pressure hydraulic units can package five tons of, li of linear force in less than two cubic inches of space. So those of you that have taken Glenn's hydraulic classes, you know about hydraulic pressure. Flip the page and I was going to bring in a port of power to show you uh, but uh, regrettably I couldn't locate one. We do have one on campus and if you look at, at figure 2634 in the le lower left hand corner where it says hand pump uh, this is typically what you'll run into and you'll use these a lot all it is is a hydraulic unit and you hook up a ram similar to the, ra to, to the ram that's on the extreme left hand side where it says single acting hydraulic cylinder, uh, that's a ram. There's also one at the very bottom, of the, at, the, at 6 o'clock on the picture, right next to the C-clamp. That's also a ram. You can see, you can see there are two different size rams. And you'll, you'll simply hook, hook up the, uh, the hand pump unit, which we, we typically call a port of power and you, you just pump it up, and you can, you can compress all kinds of, of, uh, of metal together using those. Very, very common stuff. So uh, you will probably come around those. Uh, I have used the bigger ones, and you use a hydraulic system there, and uh, uh, a powered. It'll, it'll have a power motor behind it. But as far as getting around the job site, uh, especially in construction, you're going to use the portable type that you have to pump up by hand. So, uh, yeah, read about hydraulic tools. What I want to know here is uh, uh, on page 657, and uh, some of the things that you can use them for. And know the term port power. Uh, let's see. I'm skipping hydraulic bending machines for the most part. Go over to the hand braking, uh, hand bending brake. Read about that. We have a we have a hand brake. In fact, we have a couple of hand brakes. Um, the read about the hand box and and pan brakes because there's a question coming out of there. Uh, if you look at Figure 2640, and I think I've got a picture of one of these. Okay, this is a uh, this is a guy using a using a handbrake, and you can see you simply slip your material in there. This is a counterweight, and you press down on on a bar that he's got hold of there, and you can make bends, and you can get whatever angle you need to, and you can make bends on those. And we have two of these. There's a small one in the welding shop, and we have a much larger one, one about twice this size that we've taken out of service, and it's in storage. But this is a common piece of, uh, of equipment that you may run into. Um, 
typically if you're taking flux core arc welding you're going to be working with materials that are uh, of a bigger thickness than than uh, what this guy is working on so you may not have much of an opportunity to use a hand one uh, but you could use a, a, a hydraulically powered one to get bends I have used those before so read about hand hand bending brake hand box and pan brakes and then down at the bottom of uh, page 960 on a universal bender I want to read this put a bullet by it says the universal bender is an indispensable piece of equipment for a welding shop that welding fabrication shop it is a bending and forming tool that can bend radii and angles on a wide variety of shapes ranging from small rod through pipe and tubing to flat stock and angle iron its versatility capacity and fast easy setup make it an ideal for short run production custom fabrication and maintenance work and flip the page and look at figure 2644 2645 and 2646 and this is what they're talking about these things are used to bend pipe and tube um, sometimes they, you can do it by hand but uh, more often you'll use uh, usually it's typically it's a foot control on a motor and you'll just uh, you'll go ahead and you'll hit that foot control and you bring that around until you bend it to the radii that you want and then you'll you'll take an angle finder or some other instrument to make sure you've got the correct bend you don't want to over bend it uh, because you can't bend it back again not 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 very well so you want to be very careful if you're asked to use one of these things and don't bend it too far and usually it's a good it's a good rule if you can get away with it to leave a little extra like like say this is a say this is a piece of pipe that that we have to bend right here and we want to have six inches here and eight inches out here well you, you, you you're going to mark that and that's going to be the center of your bend you're going to put it in there and you're going to bend it around that uh, at that say say just a 45 so you go ahead and bend that and then you want to make sure that you didn't end up too short or you didn't your bend didn't end up off center so it's a good rule of thumb to leave yourself a couple of extra inches on each end so that you can go ahead and make adjustments there if you have to cut it a little bit so if, if you're in a position where you have to do that and, and you can have a little bit of waste, go ahead and leave it a little bit longer than you need to. So uh, know about a, a handbrake and know about a, a universal bender because you're going to have questions on that. Um, if you look at on page six, uh, 963, figure 2647, you can see a guy using a, a shear that's just like the shear that we have, uh, a different brand. Um, but it's typically it's a typical shear and this guy is a, a welding instructor demonstrating the use of a power squaring shear shear if, if, if you've looked at these pictures really carefully as you go through here these people scare me to death I don't see any of them wearing gloves I just don't see any of them wearing gloves that just scares me to death small hand tools uh, I brought some tools study the picture there because you're gonna have a question on hand tools and uh, I've shown you some tools already. Uh, the magnet, the angle file uh, finder, the C clamp, our uh, two hole pins. These are all things that are going to be in your toolbox. Now if you're, in, if you're in construction where you're out on a power plant or something like that, you're going to have a tool bucket and you're going to be carrying all this stuff in your tool bucket. You're going to have some uh, uh, channel, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, vice grips you're going to have your wire brush, of course, your chip and hammer, of course, a regular hammer. Uh, usually you're going to carry needle nose pliers. You'll carry um, a standard screwdriver, uh, a Phillips screwdriver, a crescent wrench, a hacksaw blade. Why a hacksaw blade? Well, if you're, if you're welding and you're doing groove welding on, on pipe, a hacksaw blade is good for reaching into that root opening and removing any chinged errors on the inside. You're going to have regular pliers. All these tools you're going to have either in your toolbox or in your tool bucket. Uh, either a, a, a triangle, a, a, a tri-square like this or a regular framing square. Actually, I usually, usually carry both of them. Uh, various files. You're going to carry various files because these things are, are, are important for your work. Um, then we have an angle fi uh, finder here. This is good if you have if you have a, a pressure vessel and you've got a a, a a branch coming off with a flange straight up, but you also have to have one here. Well, then you can set this on there, and it's got a little torpedo level there. And you find your radius here, your angle here, and you can put this along the face of the flange, 
and make sure that it's properly aligned in relation to the other ones. So you're going to be using one of these. Um, a, a center punch, you're going to use a center punch to, and you're going to go around. If you have to make a cut, you're going to go around and you're going to line out that hole where you have to make the cut at. All of these are tools that you're going to be using. So be familiar with them. Study the picture in your book, but also remember these other ones and write it down. Write them down someplace. Uh, you're going to have a crescent wrench, screwdrivers, two hole pins, a torpedo level, which I did not bring in, um, hacksaw blade, and a little item we used to call a booger picker. You know, well, that's kind of an odd name. It's a non-standard term. A booger picker is nothing but a small, fine screwdriver, standard screwdriver, with a thin blade, long, thin blade on it, and you, you heat the, the end of the blade, and you bend it over like so, and then you file or grind down the end of that to a fine point. And then you can reach inside a root opening and, and use it to, to break off any whiskers. Uh, if you're using MIG, for example, and, and you've put a whisker in there, you can reach in there with that booger picker and, and, and break it off. Or if you have a bad spot and you've got to grind it out and you actually grind all the way through the root opening, uh, it's going to leave a, a, a really thin sleeve uh, on the inside of the root. And you've got to reach in there with your booger picker and you could flex it back and forth until that breaks off and it's out of the weld and then you can re-weld it. So you're going to have a booger picker too. Uh, you will get a question on hand tools, so be aware of that. So study about your hand tools. Uh, they've given us a lot of bulleted items here, uh, A, B, C, and so forth, about different types of things that you're going to use. Read that. Understand that. And that brings us to portable power tools. Let's see. Drop down to uh, types of power source. We have electric motors. Electric motors are available in various types. The most commonly used are the universal and AC induction motors for power tools. Uh, universal electric, highlight that, bullet. Universal electric tools are the most common portable tools, bullet. They operate on standard 110 or 220 volt AC or DC single phase current. Uh, the cheapest power available. These tools are best suited for intermittent operation, typified by maintenance, installation, and field work. Then you have an AC induction motor. Uh, flip the page and you have pneumatics. Uh, pneumatic power tools require compressed air to operate. This is probably uh, the most common. In, in, in a fabrication shop, you're going to use uh, um, an electric grinder or a pneumatic grinder. Uh, and pneumatic uh, chatter, what are called chatter guns. They, they run on air and, and they're, they're like mini jackhammers and you're going to use those an awful lot and they run on, run on compressed air like this. So pneumatic air tools are the second most common. Drop down to the third paragraph and highlight that and put a bullet by it. It's going to be a question. The pneumatic tool has several advantages over the universal electric tool. Most important are its suitability for continuous operations such as assembly line work and its relatively low maintenance cost. Pneumatic power is ideal for impact tools and chipping hammers because pneumatic motors have a high tolerance for vibration. Uh, then over in the next paragraph, highlight uh, the paragraph on hydraulics and read that. Uh, then we have portable electric hand drills. I brought one in and it's very similar to the one in figure 2653 on the next page, the top of the next page. This is a portable electric hand drill, and this is, this is a pretty big one. But you can see it looks very much, very similar to the cutaway that you see on the next page. These are used a lot. Uh, a drill, of course, is going to give you a pretty precise hole whenever you're making holes. You can cut with plasma arc, you can cut with oxy, oxy settling or oxy fuel. Um, but a drill is going to give you exact dimensions on whatever size hole you want to cut. And again, it was my experience that I didn't have to drill a whole lot of holes. I mean, occasionally you would, but my, my career was more involved with the metal fabrication and, and welding aspects of it. And I didn't have to do a whole lot of this. But you may, you may get into that. So know about electric drills. Um, and in that case, all I'm really wanting you to know is, is, is what they are and how they use, what a chuck is. Read about sanders and grinders. Uh, you've been using grinders and buffers, and when you first started here, you should have watched the safety film on, on how grinders are used. Um, 
If you look up page 696, pardon me, uh, 969, uh, look at figure 2654. Well, now we've got a, got a person who's properly dressed. Uh, this person is wearing safety glasses. They've got full leathers on and gloves. But what's wrong with that picture? You know, I, I look at this picture and I go, man, that picture must have been taken 30 years ago because there's no guard on that grinder. And that is an immediate OSHA violation today. So this would not be acceptable in any kind of a work environment. Go to the next one. And this is a pneumatic grinder. Uh, you can see the vent holes on the side of the grinder for the, for the air where it passes through. Uh, and again, this guy's back here using no gloves again. But I wanted to draw your attention to the, the stone. They're, they're using a big uh, stone on the bottom of that to grind with, and, and you're going to run into that because that's very common. Those stones will last a lot longer than a grinding disc, and so if they can save money, the company's going to do it. And you're going to see a lot of those grinding stones, and you're going to have to use them. Um, page 970, magnetic base drill press. Know what that is? A magnetic, it, it, it's called a, uh, it's called a uh, um, mag base, a mag base drill. And they're pretty big, they're pretty heavy, uh, actual size would probably be something about like this. That might be a little large. Uh, here's, your, here's your drill bit, and this is a big electromagnet. And of course it's got a power cord going out. And it's got controls here on the side. And you got an on-off control for the drill itself, then an on-off control to engage the magnet. And it's, it's usually got a handle, big handle on it like that. And you can, you can make a cut in any position with this. And, and they weigh about 35 pounds. I've, that's probably a little exaggerated on the size, but they weigh about 35 pounds. And it's got, a, it's got another handle on the other side that you can pull down just like a normal drill press. So you, you'll, you'll set this in position, and usually, I got that backwards, usually the base comes out like this, uh, and, and you'll, you'll put that on, on a, whatever metal surface you're going to use, and then you can come down and you can drill a hole in it. And so this will run up and down, and, and you drill your hole. But one thing you've got to be careful of is uh, you can't really get down and really grunt with that thing because you'll, you'll pop the, the magnetic seal. Uh, and it, it can come off. So know about a mag, uh, a magnetic base drill, because again, that's a very, very common piece of shop equipment, and you're probably going to be asked to use one of those things from time to time. It's a heavy industrial piece of uh, equipment for drilling big holes, and you usually start with a pilot hole, a smaller hole, and then you switch to a larger bit and, and make, uh, make your precisely dimensioned larger larger drill holes. A, a lot of times they would use these on, on pressure vessels of a quarter of an inch thick or so so that you could weld, or pardon me, so that you could cut a little hole right there to put in what's called a weldalette. And a weldalette just drops into the hole like that and then you and then you simply weld it up. But you would you would drill that hole first. So you may have to use that. Um, know about that. Beveling machines, well Beveling machines now have a, have a mandrel that goes inside like a piece of pipe or a boiler tube or something, and it, and it runs on compressed air, and it'll spin around, spin around, spin around, and you can, you can machine or put bevels on the end of tubes and pipes and stuff like that. Read about that. I'm not really going to ask any questions about that, and that's more for a construction site type job. Uh, weld shavers, I wanted to bring your attention to this because I've had to use a weld shaver before. Look at figure 2667 in your text. And this is what it looks like. This is called a weld shaver. Now, that's, again, that's not a, a very good picture of it. But in your book, you can see very clearly, right down in here, that is a, that is a carbide bit that's about 3 quarters of an inch wide. And it spins. And this runs on... Uh, on pneumatic air, and you pull the trigger and that thing spins, and it chops up, it just eats away the top of a weld. And you can take that, that weld off of there in no time. Um, it throws off a lot of, lot of metal burrs, um, a lot of metal shavings, but it'll, it, it'll, it'll eat into that and take it off 
in a heartbeat. So you may be asked to use one of those. I've never had to use them very often, but they're quite a tool. And what they don't tell you in the book is it just, it just vibrates the heck out of your hands. So they're very, they're kind of hard to control. Um, I don't think I'm asking any questions on that, but I may. So highlight where it says weld shaver. I do have a bullet by it. Uh, then on the next page, lathes. Well, a lathe's getting more into machine shop type stuff, but I wanted to throw this up here. This is figure 2669 in your text, and I wanted to show it to you because we have one, we have this lathe almost identical in the tool room. So if you haven't ever run anyone, uh, run one of those things, stop by and look at that, and, and, and Jeff or I can show you quickly how, it use, how, it's, how it's used. You shouldn't have to use one, though. Um, then on page 973, a pedestal grinder. Know about a pedestal grinder? Uh, on page 974, there's a picture of one. We use them in, in our grinding room all the time, so uh, read about those. And uh, let me see here. I think that's it. And that's it. Okay. So I've talked about, or at least told you where those questions are going to come out of. There's, there's 25 questions. And it's all about the basic shop equipment that you're going to run into. At this point, you're, you're pretty familiar with a lot of this stuff, but some of it you're not. Don't just read about what I've mentioned. I mean, you need to put it in context. So read the entire, the entire topic before moving on. Don't just read those uh, specific paragraphs that I, that I have talked about. If you have any questions, just get with me. It's going to be a pretty simple test, 25 questions. Uh, 15 of them are, I believe 15 are true and false. Uh, five are completion, and uh, the remaining five are multiple choice. Thank you very much for your attention.